Hey everyone, my name is Josh Wilson. I'm one of the pastors here at Storyline Church. Thank you for tuning in for our online service. We are switching things up a bit tonight. We're stripping our service of music. We're gonna do more of a devotional type of style of sermon. Um, but before we do that, we have a number of slides that are going to pop up on your screen. You can follow up as necessary and as prompted on those slides. I want to give you a heads up on two things, though, before we dive in. So first, we have our first movie night in the park on July 16th in Francis Park. You can find all the information about that on social media. But we want you to invite, invite, invite people to come out to this event. We want to meet as many people as possible here in the city and connect with them and get them plugged in to the life of our church. So please invite, invite, invite. Secondly, we have our next in-person gathering on July 18th. So we are meeting in a new location. You can find all the information about this on our social media pages. We have also sent out emails regarding this new location. So please make sure you get this marked on your calendar. Be ready to figure out how you can serve at this service and then come ready to invite people to the service as well. So we're going to take a 60 second break. You can follow up with all these slides as necessary and we'll be right back. Hey everyone, welcome back. We're continuing our Summer in the Psalms series tonight. We're looking at Psalm 128. So I'm going to read the Psalm for us. We'll take a short break and pray, and then we'll look at how we can apply this to our life. So Psalm 128 says this, How happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. You will surely eat what your hands have worked for. You'll be happy and it will go well for you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house and your children like young olive trees around your table. In this very way, the man who fears the Lord will be blessed. May the Lord bless you from Zion so that you will see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life and peace be with Israel. Let's pray real quick. Father, I pray as your Bible tells us that it pierces our own heart and our own soul. And so we pray that this scripture, the Psalm 128, would do what your Bible promises, that it pierces our own heart. They would hear a unique word from you. And God, I pray that you meet us where we're at. We're coming from so many different places and phases and difficulties, highs, lows that are going on in our life right now. And we pray that as you are the God who is immense, who knows all things, who's in all things, who does all things, that you would be with us where we're at this evening. We ask and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, what I want to do tonight is I want to talk briefly just about regret. So it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter what season of life you're in. We all have regrets in our life. And so my question to you is what is your greatest regret? So for some of you, it may be previous dating relationships. Some of you, it may be financial purchases or decisions that you made. Some of you, it may be broken friendships or relationships because you caused distrust in the relationship. Some of you, it may be succumbing to peer pressure. Some, it may be bullying. I, it, the whole list could keep going on. We all have various different types of regret. Mine is this. So um, as I was a senior in high school, I was up for this scholarship. It was sort of the student board for this college. And you had to go through these litany of interviews. And I'd made it to the final interview. 
And I was in the middle of this interview and I just completely botched a question. I froze in my place and it took me a while to come up with a response to this question and I blew it. This was a full ride plus additional benefits for while I was in college and I blew the interview. I missed out on the scholarship and it's one of my biggest regrets that I didn't prepare more for this interview before I went in. It had so many financial implications on my life and I wish that I would have taken it a little bit more seriously. Here's the thing, all right? The worst regrets though are from those who are at the end of their life and realize they prioritized the wrong things in their life. So work over family, finances over friendships, pleasure over purity. There are so many different ways that people regret at the end of their life, the way that they chose to live their life and the direction in which they went. As we're looking at Psalm 128, it gives us a picture of how you can live without regret. It gives us two specific things that if we were to practice these in our life, that we would never, not once, regret us living and following in these footsteps. And the first one is the fear of the Lord. And the second one is obedience to the Lord. These are two things that you will not regret in this life that if you are lying on your deathbed and you look back and you reflect on your life if you live within these two spheres you will have no regrets so here's what i want to do tonight i just want to consider these two paths or these two ways that we live in this life and then conclude with some application so first let's look at the fear of the lord we find both of these in the very first verse of our psalm the psalmist writes, how happy is everyone who fears the Lord? Now, the question for you might be, and it is for me as well, what is the fear of the Lord? Are we to live as if we should walk on eggshells around God? We know that God is omnipresent. And so does that mean that if we are to live in the fear of the Lord, that we're constantly walking on eggshells? Well, if you look throughout the rest of the Bible, you know this can't be true because you see that God is a very personable with us. He invites us in and he wants this intimacy and relationship with you. We see 1 John 4, 18 um, gives us a picture that fear is, there's a certain type of fear that's to be actually completely abstracted from our life. There's no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. So it's not this fear of punishment in our life that this is talking about. Rather, it, the fear of the Lord is speaking about proper reverence. So I have a great dad. I love my dad. Um, my dad was present. My dad was instructive. My dad was invested. I don't remember a time where my dad wasn't at a ball game of mine as I was growing up. My dad took me and my brother around and he showed us how to do multiple different house projects around our house as he was doing them. He made us come along. I didn't care for that at the moment, but now I love that he did that because I've learned so much from him. He taught me how to read my own Bible. He encouraged and helped me in my own personal interests in the direction that I wanted to take in my life in terms of my vocation and just the things that I was really enjoying, my habits, my hobbies. Now, while my dad was all these things, I still lived with a sense of fear of my dad. Not because I thought he was going to backhand me at any, any moment or because if I screwed up, he was going to disown me, but rather I held a deep respect for my dad. See, in my mind, my dad was monstrous, but in stature, not in brute. And David here, who's the psalmist, is suggesting that we relate to God in the same way. That's what he means by fear of the Lord. You see, in teaching the Bible, I think we pastors spend much of our time trying to connect God to your personal life. And so since Jesus is not physically present with us, we just want to draw out how God is this personal God who wants to know you. He does know you. He knows you more better than you know yourself. And he wants you also to know him. And he wants this personal relationship with you. But I think the flip side of this is oftentimes we make God so personable that we 
sometimes lose the idea of reverence in our relationship with God. You see, think, we say things like God just wants to hear from you so you can come and talk to him however you want. But if we're really honest about that, like there's a measure of reverence that we need to have in even our conversations and our prayers with God. And the truth of the matter is that God is worthy of your reverence. As my earthly father was personable, so too is our heavenly father. And in fact, he's even more worthy of reverence than I showed my own earthly father. And it should lead us to live a life with this monstrous view of God that affects both our actions, our words, our attitudes. Um, I think a pastor puts it so well. He says, holiness is treating God as real. And that's how we, that's what the fear of the Lord looks like. If you live in the true reality of who God is, who he's proclaimed himself to be, that we live out of a sense of reverence. We have a fear of the Lord and we live as if God is truly he claims who he is. We live as if God is real. We treat him as God is real. We live with a reverence. And whenever you live with a reverence, there's a sense of respect. The way that you talk with God, the way that you live with God, the way that you listen to God, there's a reverence, there's a respect that happens in your life. And this is something that the psalmist says you will never forget. The way that you relate with God, this is a lot about relational heart things that are going on inside of you, this fear of the Lord. The way that we, we pursue relationship with God, the way that we relate with Him, the way that we interact with Him, it should be honoring and it should be filled with awe and it should be reverent in the way that we pursue Him. These are things that you will never regret because the way that we walk and live in relationship with God fulfills the deepest desires of your own hearts. So that's the first one. The second one is this, that we walk in His ways. So the psalmist says, how happy is everyone who fears the Lord and who walks in His ways. Derek Kidner, Derek Kidner, he's a um, theologian, he's a commentator, he writes books on the Bible. He relates walking in his ways to the habits that we learn from God, or literally the way that God acts in the way that he lives. And not only will we not regret relating to God properly, that we have this reverence, but we also will not regret modeling God in the way that he acts. And Jesus made it abundantly clear how we are to live this life. In Mark, Mark chapter 12, Jesus is being questioned and debated about answers about the Bible, about God, about following God and what it looks like to obey his commands. So one of the scribes, which is this writer of the law, asked Jesus, which is the most important of all referring to God's commands? And Jesus gives us two commands in response. He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the second one is like it, that you are to love your neighbor as yourself. See, these were the guiding principles that Jesus was giving us by which we are to live this life. And we see no better example of these guiding principles than Jesus himself. We see Jesus relate to how he has fulfilled both of these commands. John chapter 14, verses 30 through 31, both of these are actually in Jesus' farewell discourse, his final words to his disciples. So John 14 is the first one. John 15 is the second one. John 14, 30 through 31 relates to how he's obeyed God. He says, I will not talk with you much longer because the ruler of the world is coming and Jesus has given his disciples a forewarning that he's about to leave them. And Jesus continues, he has no power over me, speaking of the ruler of this world. On the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the father. Look, I do as the father commanded me. There's not one command that Jesus didn't follow or obey in his life that the Father gave him. In fact, he had such a personal and intimate relationship with God that there were very divine instructives that God gave Jesus as the Son of God to go and live out and do in this life. And Jesus is saying, I've done every single one of them. There's not one that I haven't done. He did this to show the world that he truly loves God, that he truly loves the Father. In the second one, John 15, 13, Jesus says to his disciples, no one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. And we see that Jesus goes and he does that. He's denied by his followers. 
He is beaten, he's crucified, he's hung on the cross, and he dies in our place. He lays down his life for his disciples. But what we also see throughout the Bible is not only did he lay down his life for his friends, he laid down his life for the whole world. Those that were enemy in their minds against God, Jesus laid down his life for them. So he treated his neighbor with the utmost respect by literally laying down his own life. So here's what the psalmist is saying, that if we live this way, that if we walk in the ways of God, if we love God with all of our being, our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and if we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, literally doing for them what we would want them to do for us to the utmost respect as Jesus has done by laying down his life, the Bible tells us that you will not regret doing this. You will not regret loving God with all of your being and then loving your neighbor as you too want to be loved. And the psalmist tells us walking in his ways generally leads to a few different things. All right. So we see this in verses three and following. The first one is provision, that you will have provision in the things that you need in this life. The uh, psalmist says you will surely eat what your hands have worked for. Here, it's, this is basically saying, hey, honest work, true, honest, hard work reaps what it is has sown, and then it also will pay off for you in this lifetime. That if you work hard over the course of your life, that you'll be have what you need at the end of your life. But even in the present, if you have honest work, you'll have the fruits of your labor that you can now have the provision of what you need. Generally speaking, if you follow these commands that if you follow God in his ways, these are, this is what will happen in your life. You also have lasting relationships. The psalmist writes, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. So Derek Kidner just related to him. He again points out that the work within here. So this is showing faithfulness, all right? So your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house, showing that there's not that these been there's not been relationships outside of the home that have provided fruitfulness within the home. Rather, it's within the home that there is a trust, there is a a honor that has been shown within the house. So it's highlighting this committed relationship that has no reason for distrust. We all want relationships like that, especially with the ones that we love the most. We want to have relationships that last, that are enduring, that have longevity to them. But we also want them to have a place of trust that there's not a looking over your shoulder, but rather you can truly and genuinely know that this person loves you and that there's no fault in their words or their actions. And then the last one is that there's an enduring heritage says your children like young olive trees around the table. You see, olive trees are pretty interesting. They have this initial trunk that as they are a baby tree that grows up and it shoots out the branches and produces the fruit. But as the tree ages, there's younger shoots that grow around the trunk. And these younger shoots take the place of their predecessor, predecessors, ensuring the longevity of its life. And what the Bible is telling us is that the fear of the Lord and walking his ways is like an olive branch, that your family will be like this long, enduring tree, that you have you as the initial trunk. But as time goes on, if there's fear of the Lord and you walk in his ways, there's younger shoots, which are your children that will grow up around your tree that will produce and endure and have longevity to the family heritage that you have set up. There's a passing on of these patterns in your life, the fear of the Lord and walk in his ways to your children that allows them to continue this heritage that you started in this life, which shows that your parenting can produce results that last far beyond your lifetime. What a worthwhile endeavor to invest and give your life in your own children so that you may see the fruits of your labor. The psalmist, he concludes these three different things by saying, in this very way, the man who fears the Lord will be blessed. So here's what I want to do. I just want to wrestle with application. I have a few questions for us and they stem from this. All right. So you may look at this, may look at the fears of the Lord, may look at walking his ways, and we're automatically faced with our incapabilities. That's what the Bible is. It's just sort of this mirror for us that we look at it. 
places forth the desires of the Lord, the expectations of the Lord, but then it also reflects back to us our own life and our the way that we have not measured up. And what we see in this is that Jesus is our pattern, he's also our pardon, and he's also our power. Jesus is the pattern as we just described it. Jesus is the one that has fulfilled walking in the ways of God. He's loved God with all of his being, and then he's loved his neighbors as he truly loved himself. He's our pattern. If you want to know what it looks like to walk in the ways of God, then you look at Jesus' life throughout the Gospels, and you mimic, you mirror his life in this world. He's our pattern. But as I said, the Bible is also our mirror, and it shows us our incapability, which is why Jesus is our pardon. He's the one that went and died in your place. There's a dependence upon Jesus in order for him to give us fully what we don't deserve so that he would take what he also in return it doesn't deserve. He gets our sin. We get his right standing with God. He's our pardon. But then lastly, he's also our power. See, the Bible doesn't tell us that we live with this constant incapability where we can't obey the laws of God. Rather, he gives us the power through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. This is the Holy Spirit that dwelt in Jesus as he walked and lived in this life. And as he followed and obeyed the laws of God perfectly, that same spirit has come and lived inside of you. So you get the pattern of Jesus, we get the pardon of Jesus, but we also get the power of Jesus to walk in the ways of God, to walk in the fear of the Lord. So here's my three questions for us and then we'll conclude, all right? Well, as you look at this psalm, you may be faced with your incapability. That's what the, the Bible sort of is for us. It's sort of a mirror of our own life, that we look at the expectations of God, and then we also see our incapability. So it's reflecting back to us just the ways that we don't measure up. Here's the beauty also of the, the Bible too, though. You see, we see throughout the Bible that Jesus is our pattern, he's our pardon, and our power. You see, Jesus is the pattern, as we already discussed, that he loved God with all of his being. But he also sacrificially lived this life and he loved his neighbor as he loved him, as he loved his own self. Jesus is the perfect pattern for us. If we want to know what it looks like to walk in the ways of God, we look at Jesus' life throughout the Gospels. And we mimic the way that he loved and served people, the way that he loved and treasured God, the way that he showed him reverence. That's the way that we too walk in the ways of God. But we also are faced with our incapabilities. We know that we cannot fully live up to that, which is why the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus is our pardon. He went and stood in your place on the cross so that you might have perfect standing with God. You get the great exchange. You give your sin to Jesus, he gives you his right standing with God. He's your pardon. But then the Bible also uniquely tells us that Jesus is our power. The same spirit that indwelt Jesus as he walked on the face of this earth, as he loved God fully, as he served God in other people sacrificially, we get that same spirit that dwelt in him to live inside of us. So we who are incapable are made, made now capable through the spirit who lives within us to follow in the pattern of Jesus through the power of, of the Holy Spirit. So here's my three questions for us. They're going to stem out of this pattern, pardon, and power. The first one is this. In what ways do you need to learn from Jesus' pattern in both fearing and obeying God? As we discussed how Jesus loved God with all of his being and then sacrificially loved others, in what ways do you need to learn and grow in how Jesus lived out his life, that he walked in the ways of the Lord? Stop, reflect on your own personal life. Wrestle with this question. Look at Jesus' pattern. And what are the ways that you need to learn from the way that he walked in God's ways? The second, how do you presently need, the, need Christ's pardon? How do you presently need Christ's pardon? As you think about Jesus' pattern, what are the ways that you see that you fall immeasurably short? And then as you see these ways that you fall immeasurably short, what are ways that you can begin to depend on Jesus and the pardon that he has shown to you? That you don't live with this guilt, that you don't live with this ongoing shame, but rather you trust completely and dependent upon Jesus and the pardon that he has shown you in his sacrifice on the cross. And then lastly, how do you need Christ's power? Where are you weak right now? Where are you 
struggling to find the energy in order to walk in the pattern of Jesus? How do you need to call upon the Holy Spirit in your life for the fruits of the Spirit that you may be lacking in your life? What does it look like for you to really wrestle with, to, to sacrifice maybe your sleep or whatever it may be in order for you to get into the Word and for you to get into the face of God with prayer and bringing His promises to Him and just imploring Him for the power in your life to walk in the pattern of Jesus? Think about these things, reflect on them. As a community group, you can discuss them. As a married couple or a um, roommates, you can talk through these in your own home. Um, but let's wrestle with these as we seek to live not a life of regret, but a life empowered by Jesus in now and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we, we just come and we declare our need of you. We need Jesus. We want to walk in his pattern. We need his pardon. We need the work of the power of the Spirit in our life. Would you come and would you work these things deep within our own souls? We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.